I think most artists have a very strong inner drive to do that. And if you don't have that, you're not going to discover it in a cereal box. Hello, print friends, and welcome. I'm your host, Miranda Metcalf. Each week, I chat with artists who use print-based media to do something beyond the expected. This is a bilingual podcast, so if you subscribe to us, you'll be getting episodes in English with me, as well as in Spanish with Ronaldo Hilsombrano. Together, we speak to printmakers around the globe about their practice and passions in the world of printmaking. Hello Print Friend is brought to you by Speedball Art Products, and if you're looking to add some pizzazz to your practice, check out their new line of additive glitter. Add a sparkle of their additive glitter to any Speedball fabric screen printing ink to bring out a touch of shimmer to your next design. This glitter additive can be used in nearly any ratio, whether your sparkling vision is more subtle or dripping with scintillating shine. Check out the link in the show notes to learn more. This episode of Hello Print Friend is also brought to you by McLean's Printmaking Supplies, who've been dedicated to the art and artists of relief printmaking since 1979. The small specialist team in the Pacific Northwest is the leading supplier of Japanese relief tools for printmaking in the U.S. and abroad, whose primary purpose is to help you find the materials and support you need to reach your printmaking goals. Our editor, Timothy Pauschak's two favorite tools are his Fatatsu Wari Sankakuto 3mm V-gouge and his Josoe Maruto 1mm U-gouge, both from McLean's. But you don't have to take our word for it, because these tools speak for themselves. So head on over to McLean's at imaclean's.com to find your new favorite tool and keep on carving. My guest this week is Robert Kipnis, who at 91 is the most elder print friend to date to join me on this podcast. Robert is famous for his dramatic, emotional, mesitant landscapes with windswept trees and evocative lighting. We talk about how a chance elective in art led him to a solo show in New York City only seven months later, taking up printmaking well into his painting career, what it takes to be a successful artist, and his time in the army. So, without further ado, sit back, relax, and prepare to make some not quite so happy little trees with Robert Kipnis. Hi, Robert. How's it going? Very well, thank you. Thanks for joining me. I am really excited to chat. You are one of the first printmakers who I really got to know their work. I kind of was introduced to your work at Davidson Galleries when I was there and just loved it. And so when I got the invitation and the opportunity to talk to you, it was really wonderful. It almost felt like a homecoming in a way, because I was probably introduced to your work about 10 years ago when I was first starting in printmaking. And I've since you know, gone on and done other things and started the podcast. And so it's really nice to have you on and to have a chance to talk. Thank you. Yeah. So before we get into my questions, would you maybe introduce yourself a little bit? And I always invite my guests to just answer the questions of who you are, where you are, what you do. Well, I'm Robert Giffness, and I, uh, I, I was a literature student at the University of Iowa. And uh, I needed some, I had too many credits in the English department. I think I, I graduated with about 54 credits when I finally finished, which is way more than the 24 <laughs> needed for a major. And so my advisor said, well, you've got to take something outside the English department. I said, well... And he handed me the big catalog, and of course it was alphabetical and accounting, no, art. I said, I can get credit for art, and he said, sure. So I said, well, I'll take some art courses. So I took a studio course, and I started painting. And I had always drawn since I was young. My parents were artists. The house was always filled with materials. And so you know, I went to the class, and I started painting and I just took to it like a duck to water. It was just Mm. wonderful. And I think within 10 months or within seven months, I had my first one-man show in New York City on 57th Street, which was the heart of the art world. Mm. And uh, that was very exciting. And, of course, the teacher, the professor in charge of the class, saw right away that I I was pretty headstrong and what I was going to do. 
And uh, he said, well, I'm going to leave you alone. And if you do okay, show progress, you'll do fine. And if you don't, you're going to have to listen to me. And of course, we never came to that. (laughs) He congratulated me as a as a colleague rather than as a student. It was very interesting. I was obviously, you know, precocious and I I was exhibiting and winning prizes right away. Yeah. And so, and you mentioned that you grew up with two artists for parents and that art was a big part of your life from the beginning. Was this in New York City or where were you growing up? Well, I grew up in a little town called Laurelton in Long Island. My father was the art director for Sears Roebuck oh, okay. in the New York office, and he was in charge of the New York office catalog, producing the catalog, and he was the layout director, and, and he was a Sunday painter, and there was always some material in the house. And my, father, my mother was a, uh, a fashion artist. She did fashion illustrations for, the news, for you know, gimbals and stores like that. And so there was plenty of paper and pens and inks and paints and all kinds of stuff. And they certainly didn't discourage me and they didn't encourage me. They just, I had, I could do what I wanted and I did. Yeah. And, uh, so I was always drawing and painting from a, from a very, very young age. And I just liked it. I took to it and it was very, it seemed very comfortable for me. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like it. if, you know, seven months after picking up your art class, you were showing in the city. Did you kind of from the beginning, you know, know the aesthetic that you wanted to do? I feel like, you know, you're you're really known for these um, scenes with light and shadow and trees and no people. Was well, that from the very it, beginning? It, it, no, my first works were abstract. Oh, really? Uh, Non-objective. Totally non-objective. But I felt uncomfortable with that after a while. I mean, I really enjoyed it, and I had a good time doing it. And and it seemed very, very, very interesting and engaging. But I felt I needed imagery. And, of course, this was in the heyday of abstract expressionism. Mm -hmm. And nobody, or hardly anybody, was working with, you know, representation. And I just needed it. So in in an era when representation was really not not given much to see, in fact, as I I remember very distinctly that for years, every review in the newspapers and in the magazines, basically the New York Times and the Art News, the reviews all began with the name of the artist, so-and-so and and -and so-and-so, showing in such-and-such a gallery, former student of Hans Hoffman. Uh-huh. I mean, to, to be known or to be seen, you had to have been a student of Hans Hoffman. That, that seemed to dominate the art world in the 50s, very definitely. And I was really very much against the grain. However, I did find a gallery that had, you know, really across the board all kinds of art. And it was a very good gallery, and it was a very prominent gallery, very centrally located, right on the, at that time, Madison Avenue was the hub of the art world, and this was on 77th and Madison, just north of what was then called Park Burnett, which became Sotheby's. Mm. So it was really a very good location, very good gallery, with a window on Madison and a window on 77th Street, and it was, it was a good beginning. Hmm. I sort of began at at a very high place rather than looking for some 10th Street gallery, a small gallery, or a side street gallery. It was very nice, and of course I got reviews, and they, they were nice, and I sold, and that was nice. And I wasn't making a living yet. It would be a few years before that would happen, but I was working nights in the post office for a few years, and then, and then I was a night manager well, actually, the only employee of a very small paperback bookshop on, oh. uh, on in, in Manhattan, on around 48th Street. Yeah. I'm wondering if you could speak to maybe just a little bit more about what it was like to show and sell in the 1950s in New York. Because I think a lot of us who weren't there for it, you know, we have kind of a romantic view of that time period in the art world. 
I was very fortunate because I found a gallery who was run by somebody who was a, uh, a scholar. He later became a professor of art history at Columbia. And he he was not interested in the prevailing isms that were dominating the art world. As I said, Hans Hoffman had a, a stranglehold on the art world mm-hmm. and all his students. And, and I was very much out of the mainstream. And yet, you know, he put up my show against the grain. And that very first show, we sold 17 paintings. And that mm. was a, a, quite an accomplishment. And not enough to support a family, which I had, but it, w- it was a help. And I was working part-time at the post office at night, and we made ends meet. Mm. And it was very nice. The art world was um, just beginning to open up. The stranglehold of abstract expression, expressionism was breaking, and uh, there was room for other things. It was the beginning of pop art mm-hmm. and op art. My gallery was one of the first galleries that showed some op art. They had Richard Anaskevich. It was a very interesting gallery, and it was a very interesting time. There wasn't much in the way of reviews. Uh, Everybody got reviewed. There were a lot of reviews, but they they weren't significant reviews. And it was just, but fortunately, I was selling. I, I think I sold... I think I sold 17 paintings. Did I mention that already? Mm. From the first show. And things were moving along. And at this point, you were doing figurative art? You had moved away from the abstract? Yeah, I was doing doing landscapes. I was into the landscape already. I was also doing some still lives, which I still do on occasion. Mm -hmm. I did some figure work, but that was... I could see right away that... My figure work was not, I had done a lot of life drawing, a lot of drawing from the model, but painting from the model was not as interesting to me as painting and sketching from the landscape. Hmm. Why do you think that was? Well, I think, uh, going back to my childhood, I think it goes back to then, I spent a lot of time by myself in the woods. Hmm. I grew up in Laurelton. And it was very undeveloped at that time. And there were great tracts of forests and woods nearby. And I spent a lot of time playing there. And I was very impressed by I just really enjoyed being in the woods and being in, walking along the paths. And, And yet not being isolated, being alone, but not being isolated. Hmm. I could see through the trees rooftops and I could see chimneys and and it became very much a part of my art the imagery of my art mm. yeah and so where does printmaking come into your story where were you introduced to it well that's interesting I was showing it I I showed it a number of galleries but I was showing it this one particular gallery and the dealer said you should make prints and I said well I had been to the University of Iowa where they had a big printmaking department headed by someone very well known in the field, Mauricio Lozansky. And uh, I didn't like him, and I didn't like his <laughs> students, and I didn't want any any part of all that, you know, that smelly stuff. It always reeked in there, and everyone in there was always covered with aprons, covered with ink, and I just didn't want any part of it. And But he said, no, you have to do this. And he says, I'm going to send you to a workshop. And he says, I said, well, I don't really want to do that. He said, well, he said, you have to. I've got you a commission for five editions. Mm. So, and, well, you know, he knew I was struggling and I had a family. I had some children. And I said, well, I'll give it a try. Well, I went down to the what was then called the Bank Street Atelier. It was a. Uh, I think it was a branch of Merlot in Paris. He, he sent someone over here, and they sent some presses here. And I liked it. I liked it very I took a, I took to it right away. And I did five editions, and they did very well. And, and I, was, I was launched. And was that lithography? I did some lithographs there. I, my first prints were dry points because I had bought a small press. But he said, no, no, you have to try lithographs. And I said, well, I'll give it a try. I was open to anything. 
And besides, you know, I had a family. And I said, well, you know, maybe it would help promote my work. What it did was I, all of a sudden, I had dealers across the country and I was having shows. And instead of having a show every two years in New York, I could have 11 or 12 shows a year all across the country. It was wonderful. And I was supporting my family. I didn't have to work in the post office or the bookshop anymore. It was very nice. But I really liked doing the work. That that was the main thing. It wouldn't have it wouldn't have worked for me if I didn't enjoy doing it. I really got into it very very much. I knew, of course I'm still making prints. I I discovered I walked into oh I can't remember the name Sam Flax book uh, art store, and I was buying some paint and some turpentine and stuff, and I saw these. Plates. And I said, well, what are those? And the person working there said, well, those are mezzotint plates. I said, well, what's a mezzotint? And he showed me that they were, they had a very matte finish. They had, it's a plate filled with hundreds of thousands of little pinholes. And he says, you burnish away the pinholes to create an image. I said, well, I'll buy five. So I bought five of them. I did five mezzotints. And they they turned out, I thought, very nice. I was very intrigued. I liked it very much. I was very hooked on it. And I brought them to my dealer, and he, he liked them very, very much. And he, he he sold them. And then I got in touch with other... Oh, I forget what year it was. I made a trip cross-country and stopped it. I knew I had to do something to improve my situation and I my economic situation I went cross country and I went first to San Francisco and then Los Angeles and I stopped and I sold work I wasn't going to consign it and I sold work to a few dealers as a number of things and I left with cases filled with work and I, I came back with nothing you know a pocket full of checks and it was wonderful mm. and so we were we were okay the family was okay, and and so that that was a good beginning. Yeah, and so was it difficult or fun and challenging to kind of switch the thinking and image making? So going from drawing and painting to making mezzotints, it's sort of almost like a backwards process, right? Like rather than adding the dark, you're adding the light. And I was That's asking right. what draw, the you, in mezzotint you draw the light. Yeah. Was that, did that take a long time for you to kind of switch your thinking or did you find that you took to it right away? Right away, instantly. It seemed very natural. I liked it. I liked it. I, I, I fell right into it. And I, I remember my dealer, Murray Roth, who was a wonderful man, and he was very much, very nurturing. And he, and I was young, and he said, you know, this is very good. I, you, you have to do more of this. And I did. I mostly painted, but I made prints too. And I eventually divided my time painting eight months a year and making prints three and a half months a year and painting eight and a half months a year. Mm. That's pretty much the way it went. Yeah. And so you went from working in a workshop to making your own prints. What was that sort of process like? Well, I had to work in a workshop, you know, to do the lithographs. But I, there came a point I, around 1990. I had done maybe, oh, I don't know. I think I did 450 images or so in lithography. And I just didn't want to do it anymore. Huh, uh-huh. I just didn't want to do it anymore. And I stopped making prints. I just didn't want to do it. And uh, then I came upon the Metzotent plates and, I started making mezzotints, and that worked out very well for me. And of course, they're be, they're very portable. I don't work really large. I have done some, you know, maybe twenty by twenty. That's about the largest I've worked. I know people work larger, but I, that's enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I do quite a few. I'm still working on mezzotints, and and I have a printer, and he comes to the house now, and. He picks up the the plates and we talk about it and comes back with proofs and then mails me proofs and and we go back and forth and then we get a 
what's called a bonaventure, good to prove, mm -hmm. good to print, and they print an edition for me. Hmm. And so, what do you think it's been about printmaking that's really held your attention for so long? You know, you were painting, and then it seems like once print came in, it just kind of took over your practice, and you're still No, painting. it did not. Oh, you're no, still painting? No. Well, I am. I'm not now, no. Oh. But only for the last three years. I kept painting for many, many years. Oh, okay. And I, oh, no, I painted that... I, no, I painted all the time until about three or four years ago, and I just, I just can't stand at the easel anymore. And I, I'm ninety now, ninety one. Mm -hmm. So, and if you don't, if I don't stand, if I'm not standing, then painting it becomes very static, because I, when you paint, when I painted, you know, my body moves, my, my you know, I, I'm standing, and everything moves. And there's there's a rhythm to it, and uh, there's a, you know there's a certain um, energy in my brush strokes that I can't get when I'm sitting down, and I'm just not inclined to do that. So I, about four years ago, I would say I I, I stopped painting. Mm, okay. I've been, but I I do draw and work on plates every day. Wow, and so how was that relationship then between your painting practice and your prints, did you think of them as quite different or sort of one similar exploration of, of what you were looking for? Huh. I know painting is, is, is with volume hmm. for me. I, I wouldn't say that painting is this or that, but for me, painting is, is a question of volume and tone and contrast, uh, the color, of course, but a lot of volume, whereas graphics is, is pretty much linear, although my prints are not, are not linear. They're, they're also created in terms of volume, but it's, it's very different, and I don't, I don't make prints in color. I tried it for a while. I didn't like it. I hand-colored my, my prints for a while. I didn't like that either. I liked it, but not that much. I really liked the black and white graphic quality. And, uh, and so I'm, that's what I do. I still draw in pencil, uh, on pencil and paper, but uh, I like working on plates. Mm. Yeah. And so when you, when you're going about making an image, can you kind of tell me about sort of that that process? Do you do a lot of preliminary sketches still, or um, do you oh, kind yes. of go, oh, yeah? Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, preliminary sketches are very important, mainly because in pencil and paper, you can do a lot of exploration. You can make changes. You can... Uh, there's more room for invention, whereas when you're working on copper, you really have to know what you're going to do. Do things happen? Yes, things develop, things grow, things happen. But it's it's not the same as with pencil and paper where you can make radical changes very easily. But I think that when I begin a plate, I have a very good idea what, I, what I'm going to, what the image is. Now, what happens in various areas of the image, or does it develop? Of course, it develops. But I have a I have an armature. I have a basis of what I'm doing already worked out. Mm, mm -hmm. And then, how would you describe, like, what makes a good image? Like, how do you know, as you're doing your preliminary sketches, that something is ready to be made into a print, or ready to start that side of the art-making process? Well, you know, you, you just know. Uh -huh. I mean, first of all, everything I do is not successful, obviously. I mean, I don't think anyone has... 100% success rate, but I have enough command of what I've done and what I can do and how I feel about the what I call the fractured surface. There has to be a sort of shimmer across the surface of things leading the eye from one thing to another. And and so, you know, I have, I have an imagery. I have a philosophy. I have a, well... I have a character. I guess it's my character. 
and I put that into my work. Hmm. So the the artwork is kind of an extension of you, and it's well. Is I that think what you it mean? is yeah. for, for any really expressive artist. I mean, I I feel I have something to express, and I I go about trying to do it, and I have a a general imagery and a general tenor and a general mood, and and I find it very. I find it very intense. Some people may not. Some people may. I don't know. Mm. That's the, how it affects others. It's not my concern. I've I've been lucky to make a living from my work, but that was never my goal. I mean, I I had jobs that supported my art when I was young. I was fortunate that my work sold, and so I didn't have to continue doing that. But having other employment, but. That was never the goal. The goal was to make art. The goal was to find something that I felt was inside me that I wanted to reach and express. And and, and I work at that. Hmm. Yeah. No, I, I think how you describe your work as, you know, having an emotional depth to it and an emotional tenor is is really accurate. You know, the, the, they're dramatic images often with the trees and the shadows and the houses, and they really have a feeling about them. Uh, yeah, well, it's important to me, and, and that's what I work at. Mm. I, I find it very fulfilling. And, of course, there is always that very selfish, self-indulgent aspect of being an artist. One is fulfilling one's need for this aesthetic fruition, this you know, this this sense of completion and beauty, and well, the sense of life that I have, that I see, the way I feel it and see it, and have experienced it, and I try to put it down. Hmm. Now, when I was young, I began. I was always drawing and painting, but I I, I really thought I was going to be a writer. Actually, I thought I was going to be a poet. And so I spent a lot of time writing. And it just never went the way I thought it would. I mean, I just, it it meant a lot to me. And it was very deeply consuming for me. But I was getting shows and making a living painting, and I wasn't publishing. Hmm. So gradually, I, I was spending all my time painting and drawing. And then I learned to make prints. That came much later. I didn't make prints until I was 36. Hmm. And I began exhibiting my paintings when I was 20. And painting full time. And making a living. And then the dealer said, well, you really should try making prints. And I said, well, I'll give it a try. Yeah. And when you started to make prints, you know... I know that Lori said in one of her emails that you know something like four hundred lithographs and before the mezzotints and then the mezzotints and did you find that you were able to kind of predict out of all the images you made which ones would really sort of capture people because I'm sure having made images you you understand and get a sense of one that might sell out very quickly or or get a lot of accolades. Do you find that you, when you make an image that like you know, like, oh, this one, they're really going to love this one, or does that ever kind of take you by surprise? No, I never think of that. I never think of that. Uh-huh. If it's something I want to do, I do it. Yeah. If it interests me to do it, if it engages me, then I do it. If it does well, fine. If it doesn't, that's okay, too. Mm-hmm. I have to do something that, I'm really, that really engages me and, and that I'm really involved in. It's a, it's a very personal thing to be an artist, and I've never had a commercial approach to being to what I do. I, it was always my judgments were always, and my decisions were always aesthetic, and and selfishly so. Hmm. And if it, if it worked out fine, if it didn't work out, well, that's okay too. Mm. Hmm. So having been an artist who was able to make their living on their art, and I know that that's a dream of many younger artists who do listen to the podcast, 
Do you have any advice for them or any words of wisdom for how you can make your way in the art world? My advice is not commercial, and, and, and don't think commercially, because if you think commercially, you're going you're gonna to defeat yourself right away. It, it's very defeating. You can't produce for a market. You have to make something that is unique and your own and deep and personal. And if people relate to it, they will, they will want it. If they don't relate to it, they will not want it. But if you create for a market, you will never know what you could have done hmm. if you had been sincere. You will never know. You, you, you know, you might as well fail for what you are than for what you are not. If you want to judge the market and create for a market, uh, artists have done that. I know, I know several who have, and they had decent careers, but they never got anywhere as really good, and they never made it. I, I don't think they had really fulfilling careers, and that they didn't do anything very lasting. Mm. Yeah. You might as well fail for what you believe as fail for what you don't believe. Right. Yeah. I love that. Uh, and then in terms of, of kind of finding that voice, I think that's something, too, that a lot of young artists struggle with. You know, you, you found yours and seemed to get to Well, I knew my it. voice right away. Oh, really? I knew it right away. I knew right away. And I knew what I wanted to do. And I knew what I wanted to be, and I knew how I had to go about it. And I think, I think most artists have a very strong inner drive to do that. And if you don't have that, you're not going to find it. You're not going to, you're not going to discover it in a cereal box. Hmm. I know several artists who said, "Well, I have to find my voice." Well, no. You have to start with a voice. If you don't have a voice, forget it. It's not what you should be doing. If you don't have something to say, what's the point? What's the point of being an artist if you don't have something to say, to put down, to make? That, that's what you begin with. If you don't have that, forget it. Mm hmm Yeah. And so, do you have anything right now that you're particularly looking forward to that um, people might be able well, to I'm look for? Well, I'm working on a play. I'm always working yeah. on something. What are you but, working uh, on I today? Any, I have a, a small plate. No, well, not that small. Seven by eight. It's it's an, it's a nice size. I like that size. I do not rock my own plates. I buy pre-rock plates. Mm. And I think they're very good and they're very predictable. And yeah, a lot of artists look down on that. A lot of artists don't. They're expensive, and I enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I feel like you can definitely get right to the image making that way. Hey. Yes, I can get right to it. I don't have to. I I never got. I never got bogged down in craft, which is. One of the things that I did not like about school is that, and why I didn't study printmaking. I got my degree in literature and I got my graduate degree in studio in art history and painting. But I saw all these people, they're grinding pigments, you know, preparing plates. They spent all their time preparing the craft and, uh, you know, that's not what you should be doing if you're an artist. You should be making art. Hmm. Do you think that your love of literature and, and history informed you as a, as a visual artist? I think it informed me a lot, you know. I think everything that happens to you in life, everything you absorb, everything you learn, goes into your work somehow. Being a parent, having responsibilities, certainly can be distracting at times, but it's very important, and you have to learn how to deal with all those things. 
and it gives you, and when you do, it gives you a sense of self-assurance, confidence. Hmm. I think a big turning point in my career was when I was, I first started, we first started, to, my first in my first marriage, we first started to have children, and I knew I had to get a studio separate from my home. And I got my first studio outside the home. And there was a little room downtown on 26th Street. We lived on 97th, so it seemed downtown. Today, downtown is much further down. Hmm. But I had a little, I had one room, about 18 by 12, maybe, with the bathroom down the hall. I had a sink. And I had an easel and a light, and it was wonderful. It was, you know, I closed the door, the world was gone. It was just me and my work, me, the easel, my picture. And I had curtains on the windows, so it, the only source of light was the light above the easel. And that was my focus. You walk into that room, it was a dark room, which is, and then there was a light over the easel, and... That was it. Was wonderful. Hmm. Of course, I had a hot plate and I made instant coffee and I <laughs> and I had a radio and played music. I had to play music because when I was in, earlier in my life, when I was in the army, I was I was on the bazooka range and I was teamed up with an idiot, and they were firing from the other end of the line, and my ear. One of my ears was right by the end of the bazooka, and he fired the bazooka way, way before he was supposed to, and it just it gave me almost a uh, it gave me a ringing in my ear that lasted for several decades. And so, to distract myself from listening to that ringing in the ear, which was very pervasive and very distracting, I played music on the radio. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And and did I read that as well in your time in the army you were kind of drafting for them as well, is that right? I was doing yeah, I was doing some kind of drafting work. It was it was mostly lettering, it was mostly training aids I was creating. Very fortunately, you know, it was either draw training aids in Virginia or or, or go to Korea. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember going to the you know the officers have nothing to do. They, they're just assigned to send warm bodies here and there. And they needed, you know, 70 bodies here, 70 bodies there. And I, I was assigned to go to Korea. And I went to the, rather than go to complain to the officer, I went to the PFC who drew all the lists. I guess that's where some initiative and common sense took over. And I went to him and I said, look, I don't want to go to Korea. And he said, you want to stay here in the States? I said, yeah. He said, what do you give me? I said, what do you want? He said, a six pack. I said, okay. <laughs> I got him, got him a six pack of beer and I got sent to Virginia instead of Korea. Oh my gosh. That seems like a, <laughs> like a pretty low price of entry to get to stay stateside. You know, <laughs> I think it cost a dollar twenty. Yeah. It was a very low price, but you know, I... I was desperate, and I just, I knew, I knew that if I went to an officer, he'd throw me out of the office. Mm -hmm. He'd just throw me out. And I knew that I had to go to the person who actually typed up the list. Mm. And he, took, he took someone else's name off one list and put my name there. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't have to go to Korea. Yeah. And so you were doing drafting, you said, for, for like instructions? Like... Or like training, no, no, like training, no, no. training I was aids. Doing I mean, training aids. Yeah, training aids. Well, sorry, what what, what, what was that? Well, you, you draw on plastic. You're 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 doing printing and chains of command on plastic, which are then projected onto a screen. Oh, okay. During yeah. classes for training. Okay. Yeah. 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 It was kind of nice. There were about fifteen of us in the office. Well. Maybe six or seven GIs and about 
you know, 10 or so million, what do you call them, civil service. And it was in Petersburg, Virginia. It was okay. Mm-hmm. And now, was this be- before or after taking the art class at college? Oh, no, this was much later. I went to college from the age of 15 to 22. I got my master's, I think, when I was 22. And I didn't get drafted until I was 25 and a half. If I could have, if I, if I could have avoided the draft for six more months, I would have been exempt. When you're 26, you're exempt from the draft. But they, the draft board must have been watching everyone's ages. And as my 26th birthday approached, they drafted me. Mm. And so I got stuck for two years. Mm. It was really pointless. I, I achieved nothing for the service or for the government, really. I certainly didn't do anything for national security. I wore a uniform. I was in. I lived on because I was married. I could live in town, and uh, with my wife. But I had to be there from eight to four every day, which I was, Monday through Friday. Hmm. Just like having a job. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't. You know, it was very non-military. Except once a month, I had to go on KP, which was awful. What's KP? I don't... Kitchen police. Oh. <laughs> you had a report at 5 o'clock in the morning, and you didn't sit, get to sit down until 9 o'clock at night. Washing pots and pans, cleaning dishes, cleaning this, cleaning that, helping prepare. And you, had, you had to feed uh, several thousand troops. It was a big kitchen. Yeah. I reckon. It was a big kitchen. And so, and of course, it was. Oh, go ahead. I, and of course, there was a lot of dirty dishes and a lot of dirty pots and pans. Huh. And so, were you painting at all for yourself during this time, during those two years? I painted every night and Saturday and Sunday. Mm. And I got every Wednesday afternoon off. I managed to wangle that. And every once in a while, I'd get a three day pass and. You know, I have, have a, you know, and every once in a while I get a 30-day leave every year. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I had plenty of time to paint. I had shows in New York. I was showing in New York City during that time. I was, I was working. Oh, so it really was just kind of like a, the day job that you had during that time period, it sounds like. Yeah. 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 It was like a day job. Yeah. You know, I wasn't really, I wasn't out in the field in tents and, and it was, it was peacetime. There was no war at that time. I think if there had been a war on it, it would have been very different. Mm. Yeah, but for there sure. Was, there was, there was no, there was no fighting. Mm. But, you know, they had a peacetime army and that was the law. And everyone had to go. And so you would have been like sent to Korea in peacetime then just to be a, U.S. military presence abroad? I would have been sent there. Yeah. I, was, I was assigned there, but I got my way out of it. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Huh. For a can of, for a six-pack of beer. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, well. Yeah, definitely. I don't know. Who knows what would have happened if I went over there? Mm. I mean, there was no fighting, but it was not a good place to be. Mm. We weren't welcome there, that's for sure. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, I was married, so. Yeah. I didn't want to go away. Definitely. And did you have kids at that time as well? No. No. Okay. No, yeah. I didn't, have to, I didn't have kids till later. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as we're kind of getting up to our our recording mark here, I guess I'm just wondering if is there anything. On the horizon, you want to let people know about? Do you have exhibitions coming up or good places where people can find and see your work? Well, no, because my my gallery in New York has had to relocate while their building was torn down. And a new building is being built, and they're going to have space in that. So in another year or so, I'll be exhibiting again. Oh, nice. But right now, there's not a lot going on. On the other hand, you know, I've had literally hundreds and hundreds of shows and my work is in 
well, certainly a hundred museums or more. In fact, I think I've had 30 one-man shows in museums, so I'm not really concerned about that. Yeah, definitely, definitely. But I keep working because I'm an artist. That's what I do. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, Robert, for letting me borrow some of your afternoon and for sharing your story with us. And I, I look forward to publishing it and, you know, letting people know a bit more about you. Well, thank you very much. And I... I certainly appreciate your interest, and uh, let me know where and when it appears so I can look. I can look at it. Absolutely, we certainly will. So uh, thank you very much. I think you conducted a very good interview. Oh, thank you. It was really wonderful chatting with you, and it was very nice. I, I think you asked a lot of good questions. Well, thank you. Well, I look forward to staying in touch and sharing the interview when it's out. Please do. Let me know about it. Absolutely. Thank you, Robert. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. If you like today's episode, we have a Patreon where you can help us keep the lights on and get bonus content. Like Shop Talk Shorts, where our editor Timothy Pauschak digs deep on materials, processes, and techniques with past guests. Also, if you've listened this far, you just might be that special kind of print friend who would leave a review for us on Apple Podcasts. We love reading them. It means the world to us when you do, and it does make a difference in this podcasting gig. And that's our show for this week. Join me again next week when my guest will be Anne Schaefer. Anne is a print historian, enthusiast, advocate, and host of the wonderful printmaking podcast, Plate Mark. We talk about her research and how all roads lead back to William Hader, the Baltimore Fine Art Print Fair, and what it's like to be on the front lines of print education. You won't want to miss it. This episode, like all episodes, was written and produced by me, Miranda Metcalf, with editing by Timothy Pauschak and music by Joshua Weber. I'll see you next week.